Ambassador, I'd like to turn to you. I mean, leaving aside all the wooliness and um, be quite in you know, all the political correctness about the transatlantic relationship, it has changed, and the US has different interests. I mean, what sh actually in this case should, should the Europeans do besides complaining and navel-gazing? Thank you, I think, for that, uh, that segue. Um, well, at first, I just wanted to say something about the idea of inter interdependence, and just to say that um, while all of the smart people in this room, all of us, uh, take this as a given, that this is, this, is, this is actually a new, a reasonably new analytical point, and it's one that was not shared uh, uh, as recently as a few years ago. So uh, I, I, I put this forward just to make the point that um, uh, the idea of interdependence, as Nick pointed out, historically has been something to avoid, uh, that, that's, that security was meant to provide independence or lack of vulnerability to others. And so this notion of interdependence is something new and, um, <clears throat> and it will be challenged again as well. So uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't take it uh, for granted. Um, and the next point I would uh, simply make is um, to go to this other point um, that um, Pavel has mentioned before and um, uh, um, my good friend, Minister Dovgielewicz, just mentioned about the United States and its orientation. So the argument goes that President Obama is a Pacific president, capital P, uh, and the argumentation somehow goes to, you know, where he was born, the states he lived in, the countries he lived in, uh, uh, and then maybe some geopolitical developments and, and such. And I guess I would say that this is not, to me, a particularly compelling or very analytical uh, judgment. And I would say that the degree to which the world has become more interdependent, and it has, and the degree to which interdependence is not only a function of the fact that addressing problems requires applying many different kinds of solutions to problems, but is also a function of the fact that there are developing power centers, that doesn't mean that um, transatlantic relations are less important. Analytically, it actually means that transatlantic relations are relatively more important if, in fact, the, the, the idea is, as I believe, that uh, 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 in order to deal with the problems we face, in order to promote the values we seek, we need to work as closely as possible with our closest allies, and when they're not allies, partners, those in Europe with whom we are, share the greatest economic relationship, the greatest uh, trade relationship, the greatest military relationship, etc. <clears throat> Thank you. Are you finished? I wasn't actually. <laughs> I'm just wondering. You had a long talk there. Um, I was asked just also to say something about the future, and I, I, I guess I would say that you know clearly what we need to do is to, in the absence of the compelling bumper sticker of uh, NATO enlargement or uh, EU enlargement for the countries of, uh, of Central Europe and Poland, etc., to find ways to make the narrative compelling and to find ways to fill the agenda. And I guess I would say that uh, you know, clearly one area is to work together on promoting democracy in the East. The EU is still trying to figure out what it wants to do with the Eastern Partnership Initiative and it is in, in, has this uh, very uh, process-oriented debate about whether there should be friends of the Eastern Partnership Initiative, et cetera. I don't think that that's particularly important. I think what's important is that we actually do things together uh, and, and compare notes and try to coordinate on our activities. The United States is putting lots of money into uh, the, the, the countries of the Eastern Partnership Initiative, over $300 million uh, in 2010. Uh, and so, uh, so I, I think that uh, th this is obviously one area. Energy security is clearly uh, uh, another area. Democracy promotion more broadly is a third. And of course, security <coughs> remains fundamental and there's more we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, I, thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, I wonder, and I'll, I'll turn to Jan Pascu on this, I wonder what happens though, um, and we've, we've put the Iraq war behind us, um, how some of the Europeans um, had different fundamentally different views. But I wonder what happens, for instance, when Turkey, as you say, emerging powers, and Turkey is an emerging power in its own right, in, in, in its own region. I found the whole reaction by the US, uh, at least part of the administration, over uh, Turkey um, and Brazil uh, being members of the, uh, uh, not permanent members of the Security Council, reaching out to Iran. And this clearly ruffled some feathers or upset the status quo. Um, on this issue, you know, this whole interdependency and emerging new powers, I'd like to ask, uh, Jan, uh, you know, do you have any, what happens when the interdependency actually 
has different views. What is interdependency when, when you can't have, a, you can't have a, a, a unipolar view of the world? For instance, how Turkey wants to deal with Iran, but the US and perhaps some countries in Europe want to deal with Iran differently. Well, usually, to be short, to answer to your question is uh, look at the family in which the husband has one view and the wife has another, but the family still goes on. Uh, but I would say, you know, that the current international environment is highly competitive in terms of influence, uh, positioning, and natural resources. Uh, this thing, uh, this situation has been created by the move towards a multipolar world, but and accelerated by uh, by uh, the current crisis. I think, you know, that particularly Europe, the West, is uh, if it's not paying attention and stays complacent would lose the initiative in this system. Uh, for 500 years, we had the initiative, and we, we are about to lose it if we do not pay attention to that. I think you know that we are still in control because we are the architects of the system. And actually, we created the system, and we set the rules of the system. We still control the pecking order, so to speak. Um, and, uh, but that is mainly due to the fact that the United States is uh, still competitive. If we look at the statistics, demography, R&D, uh, military spending and everything, the United States is still competitive. And I think you know that the West is competitive because the United States is competitive. But at the same time, the United States is confronted with the divided attention. Up until now, it was the transatlantic relationship. Uh, Cold War is over, and now uh, the new uh, center of power, which is East Asia and China, are raising, uh, and therefore, you know, the United States has to divide the attention. Which means, you know, and the question is, does that mean that uh, the relationship with Russia becomes a purely European affair? Yes or no? Um, and I would say, you know, that within, the, within Europe, we have some fault lines. We have the United States, uh, Europe and the United States. Uh, I would say that Europe wants more independence. The United States has all this plate full of global responsibilities. And then we have within Europe, it's Western Europe and Eastern Europe. I think, you know, that Western Europe is less committed to Atlanticism, but we are still committed to Atlanticism in the East. And I would say, you know, that uh, Europe as an institution and its members, there is another fault line here, because we see the members trying to take more and more uh, on their own uh, initiative, and therefore, you know, using the European Union only when it serves them. But if we look at the summit in Potsdam, between Germany and Russia and uh, the Deauville summit uh, next uh, week, then we'll see you know, that this, uh, this matter, which is so important to all the members, is being decided outside both the EU and NATO, and then you know, try to be sold to the members inside. And this is, I wonder if this is really acceptable. So uh, there are other things like uh, re the resistance to a common energy policy or the renationalization of, uh, of uh, some uh, common policies. I would end up by saying, you know, that uh, for, for uh, Eastern Europe, uh, countries in Central and Eastern Europe, the yardstick with which we judge both Russia and the West, Western European countries, is the war in Georgia. Thank you.